papers that you've seen with the iPad or technology, right? How many of them, keep your hands up, have failed to learn how to use that technology? <coughs> of course they learn how to do it, right? Of course they, because it's relevant to them. Or the 16-year-old that says, you know what, take the keys back, Dad, I cannot figure out how to drive this car. <laughs> no, right? That does not happen. And, and some of these activities we know are as cognitively sophisticated as school activities. So this hit me like a ton of bricks. At 24 years old, which I felt like was the longest year of my life because I felt like I was failing miserably at educating kids that I loved. And I took that very personally, right? I could not sleep, and I could not eat, and I dreaded going to school to teach because I felt like a failure. I was taking this class and reading about this theory, and I said, there's a logic to why I'm failing these kids. I'm asking them to do things that they don't feel they can be successful at. And I'm asking them to do things that I haven't made relevant to their lives. And we changed that, right? I mean, I, we changed it. In the, in the six years in the project that I worked, in the school that I worked, um, in Northern California, um, we had a 95% high school graduation rate. And a 95% college going rate. I coached the basketball team of uh, girls and Every single girl went to that program went to college. You know, some of them are judges and engineers and PhD students and lawyers now. Um, and they were also one of the top 25 teams in the country. It changed. We, we directed a program at UCLA for 12 years, 100% graduation rate, 100% college going rate. Same kids. They didn't change. What changed? Me. That's why I believe in the power of teaching. The students were the same that were failing in 1993 that were like on the New York Times in 1994. The same kids, the same family, the same neighborhood, the same poverty, the same ethnic demographics. The difference was the teacher who figured out that there's a logic to why they're not succeeding. It's not because they're disengaged or they're broken homes or whatever it is. It was because we were not motivating them. Not giving them pathways to success and not making things relevant. Those are important things to remember when you think about, like, why, why are kids not giving me what I want them to give me? It probably boils down to some version of one of these two things that's not happening. The second um, major issue, when you think about social justice and, the, and, and, and education as a social context, is uh, the importance of attachment. Now, many of you might have taken psychology classes or other places where you come across attachment theory. And, and part of attachment theory, there was uh, research done. Uh, I read it when I was in college. It was right after the fall of the Soviet Union. There were um, kids who were being adopted in the United States that had grown up and spent part of their early years in um, orphanages in the Soviet Union. And they had been taken care of. I mean, they were fed, they were clothed, they weren't abused. But they were having delayed development when they came to the United States, right? They were clothed and fed and housed. Why do you think they were not developing in the same way as other kids? Can you have a picture guess? Lack of interaction, lack of a connection to a caregiver. No one was holding them or playing with them or telling them that they loved them. And so the kids were not forming attachments. And this is research is put done over and over again in different kinds of contexts for almost 60 years now. If you do not have secure attachments, your development becomes hampered. Well, guess what? It's the same thing in school, right? People familiar with the dropout literature? If you're connected to two adults on campus, the likelihood that you drop out drops down to nil. It's not grades, right, or test scores, or perceived ability. It's connection. If I am connected, the people on this campus, if I feel an attachment, then my academic development is likely to be healthier. So part of powerful teaching means developing these attachments. How do I get kids attached to the academic world? That they like school, right? That's not an oxymoron to like school, right? That it can be fun. You know, I had a brother who hated school. We shared a, a bedroom, and he was in the first grade, I was in the sixth grade, and he would start crying every morning because he hated school that much. Because people told him that he was not smart there. And people told him that he couldn't learn there. And that he couldn't read there. And he failed all of their tests. And he was over in a group by himself. And he would cry. My parents would have to force him to get dressed every day. There's not a 
day in my life as an educator where I don't think about my brother, who, by the way, handles IPOs for a major corporation. Now. <laughs> but he hated school. He made no attachment to that world. The second is attachment to the world of, you know, literature or art or math. Attachments to others in my classroom. I feel like a community. I feel like if I was absent a day that they would miss me. And um, attachments to the larger social world. Like it's not just about me. Me becoming educated makes me a better contributor to a world that I want to change. It makes me a better participant in my family community. Right? There's a lot of evidence, a lot of scholarship, and for me, a lot of personal testimony that when we begin to focus on things like motivation, and attachment, all of a sudden, bad students get their heads off the desk. 